morning we'll turn to Luke chapter 2. We'll be reading verses 1 to 20. Looking this morning at the angel's song. And before we read that together, it's found on page 1590 in the few Bible in front of you. Before we read that together, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as the angels are full of light, and as you are light, so your word gives light. We pray that you would give light to our eyes, that we might see. You would tear away the dark veil of sin that hides our hearts from understanding and from belief, and instead that you would replace it with the light of life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke 2, starting in the first verse. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. The very first line here in this in this passage says that Caesar Augustus, in those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree. Caesar Augustus was, at least as far as Roman emperors were concerned, a pretty good guy. Uh, the uh, Caesar Augustus was a wise ruler. He put wise men in positions of authority and even did things that we would consider to be right and just. He outlawed things like adultery and inappropriate reading material. He desired to bring virtue to the Roman Empire in ways that it hadn't been had for quite some time. He gave considerable freedom, even religious freedom, to the provinces and to the subjects of his empire. Now, he was far from a good guy, as we might define it, but if you were a first century subject of the Roman Empire, he was about as good as you dared hope for. And part of his wisdom is that he was very gifted in administration, and so part of his wisdom was that he decided for the information of the empire, particularly for taxation, he needed to know how many people lived in the empire and where they lived. And so every 14 years, there was a census taken of the empire, and everybody was required to go to their hometown, the, the, home of their, the hometown of their families, to be registered. Now, for quite some time, skeptics or critics of the Bible have argued that there's no extra evidence, there's no extra biblical evidence of the census that Luke speaks of. But as we do more digging and we find more evidence, in fact, in Egypt, records have been found from the Roman Empire 
describing sentences almost exactly like the one that Luke describes here. Wherever we find extra biblical evidence and compare it to what Luke writes, we find Luke to be a meticulous and accurate historian. So probably about the year 6 BC, there's a census that's taken, and in this census, Joseph and Mary head off from Nazareth in Galilee to go to Bethlehem in Judea because Joseph was a distant descendant of the great King David. Now I suspect that even if this is your first time in a church in your life that you're familiar with the nativity scene because your neighbors or some of your neighbors will have had nativity scenes on their front yard. You have Mary and Joseph and the baby that, who's laying in the manger and you have the pitched roof stable and the shepherds and the wise men and the angels and all that. And so we're, we're familiar with that. And so the Son of God born to Mary and Joseph is laid in a manger in Bethlehem the town state. And briefly, as we hurry our way along to our main focus, which is the angel song, briefly we should consider and marvel at the providence of God. That God is able to accomplish his purposes even in ways that might seem surprising to us. The Jewish people were no fans of the Romans. They had had freedom. The Jews had won their freedom from the Macedonians for some time, and then the Romans had come in and crushed them again, subjugated them, and taken away their freedom again. And so the Jews hated the Romans. In fact, the Romans didn't like the Jews a whole lot either. The Jews had a, had a reputation for being rather difficult to govern. And so if you were assigned to be the, to be the governor of Syria or the governor of Judea, you were groaning. That was a Roman bureaucrat's nightmare. It had ruined many of careers, and it would ruin Pilate's career as well, as you see later on in Luke's Gospel. But we run into an issue here because it was to David, it was to David that the promise was made that he would have a son, a male descendant, who would be the eternal king. And the prophet Micah had said that this king was going to come from Bethlehem. But the angels had told Mary and Joseph that their child, conceived by the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb, was going to be the Savior. And the, the, problem, the problem is that Mary and Joseph lived in Nazareth in Galilee. Not just a different town from Bethlehem, but a different province entirely. And so the, the solution that God has to this problem is found in the form of this census. God uses this census to jolt Joseph and Mary into action, moving them from Nazareth in Galilee down to Bethlehem in Judea. Isn't it amazing that God can use a pagan empire and a pagan emperor and a census for the purpose of taxation, and the Jews like taxes even less than Americans do, to move this young couple from their home to exactly the place he had promised his Savior would be born hundreds of years earlier. God is able to accomplish whatever he wants, in whatever way he wants. And even as the events of the world swirl around us in ways that hardly make sense to us, even still we can have confidence that though we certainly cannot see it, as Mary and Joseph most likely could not, even as we cannot see it, the Lord knows precisely what he is doing and why he is doing it. But now we come to the heart of our focus, which is on the angels. Look with me again at just this first angel in verses 8 to 12. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. 
You've probably heard that shepherds were not a men of great reputation. Shepherds had a reputation for conveniently forgetting which animals were theirs and which animals belonged to somebody else. They lived outside in the hills. They were generally strangers, and they were viewed as sketchy outsiders to the average person. On top of all of that, they lived outside where they were perpetually dirty, and they were generally poor. But it should be no surprise to us, nor should it have been a surprise to the people in their own day, that the first announcement of the birth of the Christ would come to poor shepherds. Isaiah 61, verse 1, the Lord had said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. But even though shepherds as a whole had a rather bad reputation, for being dishonest and ungodly in their lifestyles. Yet, these shepherds seem to be different. Because the angel comes to them and he says, A Savior has been born to you. That is, that these, these shepherds are among the people who have been faithfully waiting for a Savior. Who have been desiring, as we read next week from, or not next week, on Tuesday, from Simeon's song, they have been desiring the consolation and the comforting and the saving of Israel. And so to you, the angel says, to you a Savior has been born. These are not, these are not scoundrels of shepherds. These are saints of shepherds. And so the angel comes to these men of faith. But imagine their fright and their fear as the angel comes. These, this angel is not a, a cute little girl with a gold glittery halo. And I really appreciate cute little girls with gold glittery halos. I think it's precious. I don't think we need to exercise them from uh, children's uh, programs or anything like that. But we should recall that angels are heavenly warrior messengers. That it was an angel who went through the land of Egypt and slew and killed the firstborn of every house that didn't have the paint, the, the blood of a lamb painted over the doorway. It was an angel who came to Abraham and announced to Abraham what was going to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah. Typically, when angels came to you, there was at least half a chance it was bad news. And so imagine the shepherd's fright as this heavenly warrior messenger appears to them in all the brightness of his glory. And he says to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. The Savior, the one who was promised to Abraham and to Moses and to David and through the prophets, has been born, and not just born, not just born in some distant land, he's been born in the town you are very near, and you shepherds, you are invited to be the first ones to welcome the Son of God into the world which he made. And what exactly is the announcement? The angel says, I bring to you good news, great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ, the Lord. Good news. Great joy for all the people. A Savior has been born. The Savior who would save from sin and death. The Savior who would liberate from all oppression. The Savior who would come to people plunged into destruction from the day and the moment that Eve took that first forbidden mouthful. The Savior who would finally free from sin has been born. And he has been born to you. Good news. Great joy for all the people. And what better evidence the Savior is for all people than to have the first announcement be to shepherds waiting out in the fields where they lived in the night. But what does he mean by all the people? 
Nature doesn't mean for every single last individual. He means, as you would see from the rest of the book of Luke, for all kinds of people. That he is good news for shepherds, for tax collectors, for prostitutes, and for sinners of all different kinds. That he is particularly good, know, good news for those who know and who recognize that they need him. Jesus was not good news for the Pharisees for the high priests, for the Sadducees. It wasn't good news for Pilate. It wasn't good news for the Roman soldiers who sat around his cross mocking him or for the other criminal being crucified who mocked him with his last breaths. Now the Savior is good news of great joy only for those who will come to him by faith and it will come to him by faith alone. For the humble sinner who says with Isaiah, Woe to me, for I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. For the humble sinner who, like the man in Luke's gospel, beats his chest pleading for mercy from God because he knows that he needs it down into the very last depth of his soul. For the humble sinner who is poor in spirit and hungry and thirsty for righteousness, that's the one who receives good news and for whom Jesus is good news. One of the core beliefs of this church and of every gospel preaching church, whether it be past, present, or future, is that we are saved not by anything that we do, that there is nothing that we could do. Even if we were to live for a million years, there is nothing that we could do in any of those years that would cause God to love us, that would cause God to forgive us. One of the core truths of the gospel is what Paul says, that we are saved by grace through faith. That there is nothing we can do to earn God's favor, that we are favored because God has chosen to favor us, and we are saved because God has chosen to save us. That we belong to Him. That we are His children. Not because of us, but because of him. This is a sentimental season. I like sentimental seasons. We've been playing Christmas music since the first week in November. Some of you won't like that very much. But you don't live in my house, so I don't really care much if you like it. I like sentimental seasons. I like Christmas trees with lights. I like stockings over the fireplace. I like giving and receiving Christmas presents. I like Christmas caroling. I like, I like sentimental seasons. But I don't like sentimental Bible reading. Because when we come to the Scriptures, we have to come looking for truth. And if that truth feels good, then we feel good. And if that truth doesn't feel good, we don't feel good. We don't come to the story of the Christ and say foolishly, this is good news for everybody. It's good news for everybody in this sense that it's good news that everybody is offered salvation if they will receive it by faith. But it is not good for those who will not come to the Savior by faith, leaving everything else behind and coming to God and saying, I need Christ. All my eggs are in His basket. All my hope is in Him. I bring nothing to you that you should love me. I simply receive that everything I need for salvation belongs in this person who is Christ, who was born in Bethlehem on the night that the shepherds heard the message from the angels. We don't have good news just because it's good news. We have good news because God offers us salvation and He offers it by faith and by faith alone. Paul says this in Romans 10, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, 
you will be saved. Confess and believe. Ask for mercy and you will receive it. Let me get into the song itself. Look with me at verses 13 and 14. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. It's subtle, but you should recognize the mercy of the angels. Right? The, the shepherds were terrified at the appearance of just one of them. Just one of the angels was enough to cause them to quake in their boots, so to speak. And so just one angel comes first, and he terrifies them, but he convinces them that he comes not to kill them, but he comes to bring them good news. And then once they've adjusted to him and trusted him that he does in fact bring good news, now the whole heavenly host comes. If the whole heavenly host had come at first, they'd have probably all killed over dead from fright. But now these, this whole heavenly host comes and they announce that this salvation is offered to these shepherds and others. And they sing glory. Glory to God in the highest. William Hendrickson says that above all else, this song is an outpouring of adoration to God. Glory. Glory to God. One of the strengths of language and one of the weaknesses of language at the same time is that the same word can mean many different things and it can have a, a degree of meaning that varies greatly. For instance, if I'm watching a, a Cubs game in the summer and I see Anthony Rizzo hit this towering home run that goes over the fence and over the stadium itself, I might say, that was glorious. And in some sense it was. If I'm standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon, or if I'm in the Serengeti watching the, watching the migrations of the great hordes of, of beasts through the plains, or if I'm staring into the sky on a, a dark, clear night watching the stars and the constellations, I might say, this is glorious, and it would be true, that is glorious, but the degree of gloriousness in those things is small compared to the immensity of the glory of God. But all the rest of those things are just little points of light pointing to God who is himself light. They are just little good things from whom all good things flow, pointing to the fountain who is God himself. God, as we talked about last week, God is, God is good. He is glorious to the superlative, to the infinite degree. God defines glory. And so the angels sing glory to God in the highest. But, but at this moment, what are the angels glorifying God for? But the angels are glorifying God that Jesus has been born. And you have to imagine that the angels' heads are spinning, right? The angels' heads are spinning. These are perfect creatures. They have never personally known sin. These are perfect creatures who have no need of salvation, who from the first moment they were created up until even now this very moment have been perfect and have done exactly what God has required of them for every moment of their existence. They have only known sin because they have seen other creatures, particularly the other angels, the fallen angels, commit sin, but they themselves have never known sin. And they must look down upon sinful creatures, such as ourselves, and marvel that somehow God would choose to save. That somehow, even though he had not offered salvation to the other angels, that he had not in any way provided a way out of sin for them, somehow to these little sinful rebellious wretches, God has offered grace. 
And not only has he offered grace, but in order to give that grace, in order to save those sinful wretches like us, his son became one of us for the purpose of dying as one of us and dying for us. You must think, if they wouldn't vocalize it, they must have at least thought, how can this be? How can this be that this God whom we have known, that he would take on flesh to walk and breathe and bleed like one of these sinful creatures? Peter tells us that the angels long to look into the mysteries of the gospel of the grace of God because they do not understand why God would be so good to people who have failed him so miserably. And they don't understand it, but they celebrate. Glory to God in the highest. I don't understand it either. I understand it insofar as I'm allowed to understand it from the Word, but I do not understand how it is that an infinite, perfectly good God could love me. And I cannot understand why, why for a moment he would decide to send his son in human form to suffer and die for me, or for you for that matter. I love you guys. But you're not that great that God should die for us. I do not understand it. I, perhaps less than the angels, but I long to look into the mystery of the will of God. I do not understand it, and neither do you, but we can celebrate it with the angels. And we can join our voices to the heavenly chorus, saying glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest for Christ. Glory to God in the highest for salvation. Glory to God in the highest for grace and for mercy and for forgiveness. Glory to God in the highest for giving eternal life to sinners who deserve to die. Glory. Glory to God in the highest. And I want you to know, Mary would have made a good Presbyterian, as we saw not too long ago. The angels have a knack for good Reformed theology as well. Because what do they follow up? Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. That is, that with those who God is pleased to love, for those who have received God's favor, peace. God gives peace to his people. He chooses to give that peace. That we may rest confidently in our peace with God is possible only because God's favor rested on us first. And these angels recognize the grace which has been given to us. And as I think about this grace, and isn't that what Christmas is about, but grace? God's free giving of a gift, a great gift. To think about this grace, for me, when I think of grace, I am always driven to the first two chapters of Ephesians. Because there, Paul goes to great lengths and into great depths to marvel and to lead us into marveling at the grace and the mercy and the love so I want to read just a portion from Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1, 3 to 8. Just follow along with me. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, 
to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he has lavished upon us. Every spiritual blessing he chose us that we should be holy and blameless. In love he predestined us to adoption to himself according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us. That's what Christmas is about. It's about the lavishing of God's grace on his people. Grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. So good. There is enough grace to soak in for the rest of eternity. That you will never become bored. Even for the everlasting life which God has given to you, you will never become bored with grace. And it will always, always cause his people to marvel. And all of this is possible. All of this is possible. The forgiveness, the grace, the mercy. Because of Christ. Who was born and announced to shepherds by angels. On an ordinary evening. In an ordinary village. So long ago. As we close, I want you to notice the shepherd's reaction in verse 16. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. They hurried. Of course they did. Wouldn't you? If an angel came to you and said, a Savior has been born to you, he is the Christ, and you will find him, that he's not born across the world somewhere, that he's born right there in that town that you can see the lights from, wouldn't you hurry off to go see him as well? I would like to think that I would. And is there ever a clearer application and an easier application to make from a text than this one? That as the shepherds hurried to the Savior, so we should hurry to the Savior as well. That as God has offered us grace in this one, that as he has offered us to have him, not by climbing the highest mountain or plunging to the depths of the sea, but he has offered us to have this one by faith, that we should hurry by faith to lay hold of this Savior and his salvation. The Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthians, and he says, Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today, friends, today is the day to hurry to Bethlehem's baby and Calvary's sacrifice. And today is the day to join the voice Today is the day to join the voice with the heavenly chorus and to say with the angels, glory to God in the highest. He is glorious, isn't he? Isn't he? Yes. God, we long for the day when we join our voice to the heavenly chorus in your presence when we sing and hear the angels sing and we hear all the saints who have been redeemed, all those on whom your favor has rested, and we sing together. And we sing glory to God in the highest, and we sing worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We long for joining our voices, receive 
receive our praise. We have nothing else to offer you. Or nothing else to offer that you do not have. That if we didn't praise, you would make the rocks cry out. That if we didn't do acts of mercy, you can do all things. All we have to offer is our praise. That is what you have made us to do. <laughs> so we pray that we would live lives of praise. That our lips would be filled with praise. That our minds would be praising our hearts, our souls. That our lives would be given to your praise and to your glory. And we pray that you would give us the faith to hurry to this Savior who is greater and more dangerous than we had ever dared to think, who destroys his enemies and saves his people, and who has made us his people through the cross. through whom we have been adopted as children into your family. God, give us the grace to hurry to him. We thank you for the presence, the trees, the lights, the stockings. We thank you for all these things. We pray that we, in the midst of all of these joyful things, that we would be continually hurrying like the shepherd. Not first to those things, but first to Christ. That we might receive grace. Confessing with our mouths, believing in our hearts, and being saved. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.